I mentioned yesterday spending time in Israel a month with the Shalom Hartman Institute, and I spoke about two people that I encountered, and I want to mention a third whose name actually came up already this morning. Her name is Rachel Korazim. She is a poetry teacher. She invited us into her beautiful home, exactly the kind of home that you'd want to learn poetry in, in the middle of uh, Yafo, very close to the water in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa. She invited us to teach us some of the poems that we've shared so far. And what Rachel told us is that when, since October 7th, whenever people would ask her, how are you, which in Hebrew, often people use the words of mashlomech, right? Mashlomech, which means, you know, how's your peace? But it really means like, how's your well-being today? And then we respond, I'm okay. She says, since October 7th, anytime anybody would ask her those words, Mashlomech, she would respond, Shlomi, Kshura, Lishlomam. My well being is tied to their well being. And theirs is referring to the hostages. When her husband would be asked the same thing, Mashlomcha, he would respond, Shlomi Kshura Leami. My well being is connected to my people. On Saturday night, August 31st, my two younger children and I were at the waterfront for Havdalah. Every two years when the Ashkenaz festival happens here, we, all, we always end up bringing some musical act. This year was an amazing bluegrass band called Jacob's Ladder. They spend Shabbat here with us, do a concert on Friday night and lead services. And then we get to join them for Havdalah. And Aviva was up there singing with them. And my two younger ones, Lev and Sela, were up there with me. We were holding the candle for Havdalah. In Havdalah, we say the words of Layudim Haita Ora for the Jewish people in the past, we've had light. Kenti Elanu, and so too we're going to have light. And there really was so much light up there that night. And in the people who joined for Havdalah downtown, it was amid security concerns and logistical challenges, but we came together to bring light. When I got home later that night, and it was really late, because Shabbat ended late at that time, I put our kids to bed, and I was sitting with my wife, Ryla, and suddenly she looked at her phone, and she let out a groan and this really deep sigh. And then she told me that Hirsch was dead. And I realized that as she let out that breath, that we had been holding a collective breath for 11 months. And it just released. And then later we found out the names of all six of those beautiful young souls. Hirsch, Eden, Ori, Alex, Carmel, and Almog who survived for 11 months only to be murdered. And then the next morning, we had the task of telling our children about this. And they, knew, they actually knew more of those names than I did. I knew a lot of the stories, but they knew all of them. When we told our 10-year-old Lev, she quickly started crying. Like, she's not a kid who's quick to shed tears, but she just let them out. And then she went and she hugged my wife, 
and cried in her arms for a few minutes. Our eldest, Sheila, who's 12, came home from a sleepover that afternoon. And when we told her, she actually had a very different reaction. And she has been crying a lot this year. But at this moment, there were no tears, although I'm sure they came later in the day. Instead, her response was actually all about action. Her face tightened up, and she looked me in the eyes and said, what are we going to do? Sort of like, enough is enough. What are we going to do right now? And she said, we have to do something. We have to protest. We have to write to someone. What are we going to do right now? And she really meant it. And I really, you know, sometimes in those moments you're like, ah, you're a naive kid, what do you know? But she meant it. Like she was ready to go and bring hostages home alone. And I am so glad that she's not in an age where she can actually go do that because she probably would have. And so I told her that right now, actually our job is to just let ourselves be sad. That has to be our response. We have to just let ourselves be sad. But she was protesting my response the way perhaps only a 12-year-old kid on the verge of being a teenager can do. And I think about how amazing to be in the world with such a sense of power. And at the same time, I knew that at this moment, we just, just have to let ourselves be sad. There will continue to be moments to sing and to dance and also moments to just sit in the sadness. We read from the Haftarah this morning, from Jeremiah, from Yirmiyahu, about Rachel weeping and wailing for her children. And I can't help but think about Rachel Goldberg Poland when I read these words. And the Haftarah tells us that she continues to cry and to weep because her children are a nenu, they are no longer here. And yet, the words continue, yesh tikva, there is hope for the future. And the verse promises, vishavu banim ligvulam, and the children will return to their borders, to their homes, to their families. Those words have actually also been an anthem this year. In the past, it's been an anthem for Jews making aliyah, for soldiers coming home from their army service, and this year, for the hostages. When I met Rachel this summer, she repeated the same words that she often did in interviews where she would say, hope is not optional. Hope is not optional. And though Hirsch will not be coming back alive, he was returned to his family so that they could bury him. And in his father John's eulogy, I mentioned Rachel's eulogy yesterday, in John's eulogy, he mentioned a Facebook post that really penetrated his heart. Where he said, Yehi zicho lamahapecha. May his memory be for a revolution. Just before Rosh Hashanah, when I looked at the Bring Hirsch Home Facebook group, They posted the words. The 30 days of mourning for Hirsch end on Erev Rosh Hashanah. The Shloshim just ended. And his parents wanted to tell the world, we intend to come back and fight for the 101 hostages still being held in Hamas captivity. May his memory be a revolution. 
They took their 30 days to just cry, to just sit in their sadness. And this is their way of saying, we're not giving up hope for the others. We're going to still keep on working. I don't know how they're doing that, but they are. It says in the Torah that in the moments after Moshe receives the Torah, he comes down 40 days and 40 nights being up there. He comes down, he sees the golden calf. He sees B'nai Israel, the Jewish people, doing the worst thing they could do. And he drops, or according to some commentaries, actually throws down the tablets. And they shatter, they break. Moshe puts everyone in their places, corrects their actions, goes back up for another set. Says in Dvarim in Deuteronomy, Vachtov la duchot et advarim, Asher ayua la duchot arishonim, Asher shibarta vesamtam baron. That I will write on the tablets the, the words that were on the first tablets, and you shall put them in the Aron. This is what God instructs Moshe. We're going to write the same exact words again, and then you're going to place them into the ark. Rav Yosef teaches in the Gemara that what gets placed in the Ark, what goes in the Aron? Two sets. The new whole sets that have been written and new, but they get placed along with the shattered, broken tablets. And when our ancestors continue to walk through the desert and made their way into the land of Israel, they carry both, the whole and the broken tablets. I love this story. But that's actually what we do as Jews and as human beings. We carry the sadness with us. We can't just let it go. But we don't let it hold us down either. We carry the broken tablets along with the whole because there are moments for dancing and for joy and for laughing and for bringing love into this world. I mentioned yesterday that we have three different kinds of shofar blasts. The broken ones, the shvarim, and the weeping ones, the truah. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says that the broken ones and the whole experience of shofar blowing is about sitting in our broken heartedness. But he says it's not just that. It's not just being broken. It's actually about integrating our brokenness into our lives. And that's why we have the two tekiahs on either side. You'll notice that every single time, whether we call out and blow the shvarim or the truah, it's always flanked by two tekiot, two whole sounds. Because that's how we have to live in this world. We hold on to the brokenness, but at the same time, we hold on to what is whole, what is beautiful, what is sweet, what feels perfect right now in this world. <laughs>